We're going to do something just a little bit different since um, I want us to uh, continue to wake up and really dial in. Um, I really appreciate, there, since we've gone to two services, there's been a number of sacrifices, and this is kind of a, I, I want to do a, maybe a parenthetical insert here before we dive into the message today, because um, there's been a number of sacrifices, and although we are not here to applaud people, we're really here to applaud God, I think this is a great opportunity to say, look at what God is doing in some people's lives. And um, what a lot of people are probably not aware of is a number of the individuals that are a part of the worship ministry have been for almost two months now pulling doubles, um, which means they practice with two different teams, and on a Sunday morning, they will be a part of the first team, which they're here an hour before, an hour and a half before anybody else gets here practicing, and then during the message, they run out to the annex, and they practice with the second team, and five minutes before the message ends, somebody runs out and gets them, and they run back in, and they finish the first set, and they get ready for the second set which if you don't live life like that, you're missing a wonderful roller coaster. <laughs> and there are some people that do that week after week after week and have been serving very sacrificially. And I love that, and I think it says a lot about their love for God. And uh, one of those people is Cheryl, and she's not here today because um, she's come down with the flu or something just at the last minute. And our worship team, who strives very diligently to um, honor God and, and give their very best, did exactly that today. Um, being called at the last second to say, hey, uh, Brian, who's on guitar, uh, he came, was supposed to play bass first service, and he was done. It was like, Brian, guess what? We need you for second service. He goes, okay. <laughs> and then in first service, Kathy got here, and it was like, Kathy, you're going to play the piano today. And she's like, okay. And um, God's just used a bunch of different people in a bunch of different ways. But I want us to really dial into God, because the message today is about God. And there's a song that I like to sing. We've sung it in a men's group before, so guys, you're going to have to belt it out with me, and then um, we'll bring everybody else into that. But it's a song called Sing Hallelujah." I want us to start out with that, and I want us to really focus on this is about God, and this time, and this message, and, and what we're going to learn is all about Him. It doesn't have to do with us. So that song goes, Sing Hallelujah," And um, I'm going to get off the mic. been talking about we've been talking about how when you and I live life disconnected from the truth of his word and we live life based on experience and how we feel and what we think is best it's a complete disconnect with God's word and it creates a lot of frustration in our lives it creates a lot of stress in our lives I believe that many of us live life not 
not really thinking about it, but we live life saying, what makes the most sense to me? And because of that, the greatest problem for Christians today is we believe the Bible, but we don't believe the Bible. We believe God, but we don't believe God. The greatest conundrum, the greatest frustration, the greatest struggle is I believe, but at the same time, I don't believe. There's a story of Bill and Susie, and maybe if you knew Bill and Susie, you would understand. Maybe you've been in their shoes before. And what it is is Bill and Susie had got married. They got to their second anniversary, and on their second anniversary, Bill's like, oh, my goodness, I don't want to mess this up because Susie would get her feelings hurt when Bill forgot important dates. Now, it wasn't about the gifts. She didn't really care about the gifts, but it was the fact of thinking that he actually cares enough that he remembered to get a gift. And so Bill asks all of his friends, he's like, what should I get her? What should I get her? He asks neighbors. He asks coworkers. He, and he finally, he just chickens out at the last minute. He's afraid he's not going to get a good So he, he settles and just gets a large bouquet of flowers. But he's kind of afraid he's going to goof that up. So he calls the florist, and he's like, please get the largest, most ornate um, bouquet of flowers and give that, uh, I want this sent to this address. And, and here's, here's what I want you to write on the card. I want you to write, Happy anniversary, second year, and um, or year number two is what he wrote. Happy anniversary, year number two, and then that next morning, him and his wife Susie are having coffee, and as they sit there at the table, the doorbell rings, and he thinks, here it goes. This is going to be so good, I can't miss, and um, she goes to the door, and she opens the door, and there's the florist with this huge bouquet of flowers, and she goes, oh, for me. Bill, you remembered. She's so excited. She excuses the floor. She turns around. And as she's walking back down the hall towards uh, the, the table that they're sitting at drinking coffee, she opens up the card and she reads it. And her smile turns to confusion and then turns to anger. And she is like, what is this supposed to mean? Bill, like a lot of us guys, is going, uh, I, I don't know what, what just happened. And she says, this card It says, happy anniversary, you're number two. (laughs) And you know what? When when we get disconnected from the truth, it really messes things up. And the same is true in our relationship with God. When we get disconnected from the truth, it really messes things up. And so our encouragement has been in this series, but, that we stop living a life that says, I believe, but. That we live a life in relationship with God without buts. And last week we talked about, I'm going to write a couple words down here because I think they're important. Last week we talked about the word sin, how sin is missing the mark, how you and I miss the mark in our relationship with God. Not our mark, not our goals, not our objectives, but it's God's objectives and God's mark and God's goals. So when we miss that mark, the Bible says it's sin. Well, Scripture tells us in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death wages you and i go to work we earn wages it's what we earn for what we've done now what that verse is telling me is what i've earned because of sin in my life and because of missing the mark what i've earned is death not a word we like to talk about a lot the wages of sin is death My sin earns me death. Now, if you're familiar with the Bible and you would go back to Genesis, you would find in chapter 2, as God has created this incredible garden for Adam and Eve, and they're in the garden, he tells Adam, he says, you can eat whatever you want, but there's one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You may not eat of that tree. If you eat of that tree, he says, in chapter 2, verse 17, he says, you will surely die. What we find in chapter 3, verse 4, Eve's sitting there having a, chat with the serpent they're looking at the tree of good and evil and the serpent says you won't die but you're gonna die you won't die and then in verse six of chapter three adam and eve they take the fruit they eat it guess what happens they don't kill over dead and i think maybe adam and eve thought as many of us think today the wages of sin is death i don't get it god because i've sinned Romans chapter 3 tells me all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. I've sinned, but I, I'm not dead. Adam and Eve, don't eat that fruit or you're going to die. And they say, I ate the fruit. We're still alive. Maybe the snake was right. How does sin equal death? Does God mean something I'm not understanding, or is he just trying to scare us into obedience? And I think what we fail to recognize is that death is separation. 
Death is separation. When your soul, your spirit, when it separates from your body, guess what? You're not living anymore. It's over. And, and the same thing happens spiritually. When, when we are separated from our creator because of sin missing the mark in our life, we are dead spiritually. There's a separation that takes place. If you go back and you look in Genesis chapter 3, uh, you won't die, verse 4, verse 6. Okay, let's eat the apple. They do or whatever the fruit was, they eat it. And then you get down to verse 21 in Genesis chapter 3, and death occurs. God has to take the life of animals so that he can make clothing for Adam and Eve out of skin. And we also see if you follow Adam and Eve on through their life, you find out God said originally, let us make man in our own image. So I don't believe God when he first created Adam and Eve that it was his intention for our bodies to decay and to fall apart and for us to die. Now, I don't think sin and death surprised God. I think he knew it was coming, but that does not mean it was his intention for it to be so. And yet we find Adam and Eve, their bodies break down, they get <laughs> later on in life, they do die physically. But of greater consequence, an immediate death occurs, not just the animals, but an immediate death in the life of Adam and Eve. And that is after they sin, they have to leave where? They have to leave the garden. The place that we read in Genesis, they once walked and talked close with God. They are now separated from him. A spiritual death has occurred, and they have to leave the garden. So God wasn't messing around when he said, let me tell you, if you eat that, it's not a threat. It's not, he didn't say, if you eat that, I'm going to kill you. He said, if you eat that, you're going to die. If, if you eat that, there's going to be the separation that takes place that you can't fix. You're going to break this relationship in a way that you can't even imagine. And they ate the fruit and they experienced that separation as they had to leave the garden and were no longer in a relationship like they once used to be with God. Death didn't exist until they ate the fruit. The wages of sin is death. But if we look at that Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that's the bad news. The good news is there is a free gift. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. What is life? Well, it's the opposite of death. There is a union that takes place. And, and when we step into an eternal life-giving relationship with God, there is a union that takes place of the, the soul of the created with the creator. And what this verse tells me is that there is death that takes place because of my sin and my missing the mark in life. But God also offers the opportunity as a gift, free, because you and I can never earn it. We can never be good enough to, to deserve it. He offers a gift where he says, I want to restore what's been separated. I want to bring back together again. I want to fix the broken. And so in, in the midst of death, God brings life because of Jesus Christ. And he gives you and I the opportunity to live in a forever union with him. There are a couple of words, though, that kind of plug into this. And, and I wanna, I'm going to use a couple different colors just so they maybe stand out. But the, the first word I want us to look at is justice. It's a word that probably you and I are familiar with. Justice is what we want for everybody else. You know, when we're in our car and we're going down the interstate at 85 miles an hour in a 65, because my wife is driving, not me. And she does love Jesus, and she is saved, just her right foot is not yet. So we're going down the road like a bazillion miles an hour, and somebody is riding our tail, and we finally get over, and they go flying past us. You know what I want? I want justice. I want to be able five miles down the road to go by them when they're pulled over with the cop writing a ticket and go, eh, uh -uh. <laughs> I want justice. But... Justice is getting what you deserve. But what do you and I want when we get pulled over? <laughs> I don't know about you, but if amnesia for the officer is not an option, I want mercy. I want him to go, you know what? You were driving like an idiot. But I understand you were in a hurry. I'll never forget the time that we got back from a football game late when one of our boys was playing in middle school. And as we um, came back through town, we got off of 70 and we came flying up 59, again, because my wife was dry, driving. Um, 
I'm going to blame all of our speeding on her. But um, it was raining. It was dark. And our son had been waiting to be picked up. Somehow the bus beat us back. He'd been waiting for like 15 minutes. And, oh, mama wasn't having none of her boy waiting because people were leaving. And she was concerned for him. So we come flying down this road. And we get to this stop sign. You know, the big red signs that suggest you consider slowing down. And in the rain, at night, dark, as we consider slowing down and we approach the sign and we sweep around the corner, our headlights go down the side of a car that's sitting there and it says, Sheriff. And I'm like, Nikes, we're going to get a ticket. Sure enough, he turns around, he pulls us over about a half mile down the road. And he comes up to the car and he goes, license and registration. He goes back, sits in his car, comes back for a little bit. It's pouring rain. I'm like, he's in the rain now. We are not getting out of this ticket. And he comes back up, and he shines his light on Kim, and he shines his light across to my eyes. And I'm like, he says, Mr. Hess, how are you doing this evening? I said, well, <laughs> I was doing pretty good until just about two minutes ago. He goes, well, Mrs. Hess, the reason I pulled you over, and we go through that, he said, I'm going to let you go with a warning, but you really need to slow down. And uh, I was embarrassed because I knew the guy. We, he gets in his car, he leaves, we pull back out on the road, and my wife looks at me and she goes, I'm so glad you know some of those deputies. <laughs> I'm like, look, you're burning up favors here, babe. <laughs> I want mercy when I get pulled over. And you know what? When we get pulled over and we get a, sun, we get a traffic ticket, and if you want to fight your ticket um, and you go to court, you're going to sit there before a judge, and if you're found guilty, he's going to want to give you justice. Well, we're going to want mercy. And as we stand in that court, something interesting is going to happen. The judge is going to say, Mr. Hess, <laughs> because your wife was speeding, you're going to pay $250 or you're going to spend three days in jail. I don't have $250. Well, then you're going to spend three days in jail. I don't want to go to jail. Look at me. You know what happened to me in jail? I don't want to go to jail. And then he's like, you're going to go to jail or you're going to pay the fine. Well, I don't know what to do. Here's another word the Bible talks about. Justice is I get what I deserve. Mercy is I do not get what I deserve. But the Bible talks about another word, and it's grace, where I get what I don't even deserve. That's when the judge says to me, you know what, I understand you don't have $250. And he pulls out his wallet, and he shells out the cash, and he says, you are guilty. Here's the money. Go pay your fine and stop speeding. And I'm telling you what, that is exactly what happened for you and I when Jesus died on the cross. Because he said in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. I don't want death, God. I don't want eternal separation from you. God says, I am a just and holy God. If I did not punish for sin, I would have to deny my nature of justice and truth and honor. But God, seriously, can't you just give me mercy? He does give us mercy. He gives us mercy each and every day that he should stomp us into non-existence every day. And he allows us yet another day and another day and another day. But grace fits in the picture when he says, I know you can't pay that debt. We live as sinners, and you know what? If we died for ourselves on our own behalf on the cross like we deserve, we would just die as sinners. It would never fix anything. We're not good enough even to be our own sacrifice. And Jesus stepped off of his throne and took off his holy robes, and he wrapped on skin, and he came down to where you and I are on earth, and he said, I'm going to die on your behalf because you can't pay that price. You see, it's grace. And it's so incredible. And we try to wrap our heads around it and we think, man, this is something like I've never experienced in any other relationship before. But we've got a problem in this grace relationship with God because you and I, I believe, very unintentionally do something that spits in the face of this offer that he makes. And I want us to look in John chapter 5. We've got uh, just about nine verses there. John chapter 5. I want us to read. What happens? Jesus has just um, done some teaching. He's done some healing. He comes back to Jerusalem. And in verse 2 of John chapter 5, it says, Inside the city, near the sheep gate, was the pool of Bethesda, 
with five covered porches and crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him, he knew how long he had been ill, or he knew he had been ill for a long time, and he asked, would you like to get well? I want to stop right there for just a second. Now, if you consider what's going on here, Jesus come to this place. There's a lot of sick. There's a lot of lame. There's a lot of um, people who are trying to get better. And what their perception was at that time in this pool of Bethesda, it was a large pool. Some even believe it was two pools very close to each other. A spring bubbled up from underneath. And some other ancient manuscripts talk about the pool having a reddish tint because of the minerals in the water. And so these people believe that when the, when the water bubbled up from the bottom, it was an angel stirring the water, and the first one to get into the water would be healed. Now, the Bible doesn't address whether that actually happened or not. We just, we just are aware of that was their perception. And so this guy is laying here beside the pool 38 years. 38 years he's been there. He has been sick and beside that pool longer than most people in that era lived. His life has been a frustrating, hopeless mess. And Jesus finally comes. Jesus, the great healer, Jesus comes up and he says, do you want to be healed? Not unlike he's done maybe in many of our lives. Where we look at our lives and the mess that it is and the addictions that we fight with and the brokenness that we face and the frustrations and the, just the overwhelming oppressive nature of life and how I, I, I can't get it all together. And Jesus steps into that spiritual sickness, that terminal disease that I have called sin, and he says, do you want to be healed? I can fix this mess. I can, I can make you better. You're, you're dead. You're separated in sin from the Creator. I want to unite you. I want to bring life back into your body and into your soul. I think many of us aren't so different than this guy. Would you like to get well? He asked in verse 6. And the guy says in verse 7, I can't, sir. He doesn't, even, he doesn't even realize he's talking to Jesus. I can't, sir, the man said, for I have no one to put me in the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets in there ahead of me. And Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. And instantly the man was healed, and he rolled up his mat, and he began walking. But because this miracle happened on the Sabbath, if you continue to read on, the religious leaders get all wound up about it, and they start raising a ruckus. You healed on the Sabbath, that's working on the Sabbath, blah, 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 blah. But what I want us to focus on is the fact that Jesus stepped into this man's life, and he said, you want to be healed? And the guy's response is, shh, shh, shh. I can't. I've been trying. Shh. I've just got to get in the water. Don't distract me. I'm watching the water. I got to watch for just the first hint of bubbles. And then if you could just roll me, if you could just push me with your foot, just get me in the water, I'll be okay. If I can get there, I can do it on my own and everything will be fine. Do you want to be healed? I can't. For almost four decades, I've been trying. Do you, do you want the mess in your life put back together? I can't, God. Do you see how hard we've run through life playing this series of endless spiritual whack-a-mole where a sin crops up and we crack it over the head and then another one comes up and we hit that and another one comes up and we're exhausted as Christians and we wonder why. Because of the endless tap dance where we're trying to put out fires and I'm trying to get this right in my life, and I finally got it, and oops, another brush fire, and I go over and I address that mess in my life, and that sin, and, and well, this one cropped back up. And we read the Bible, and I believe Jesus speaks to us through his word, and he says, do you want to be healed? And, and our response is, I can't. Do you not see how hard I've been trying? Do you not see how long I've been doing this? I mean, come on, God, get off my back. I'm doing the best I can. I believe you and I, in those moments, that that is how we respond to Jesus. I believe that we are, in essence, saying your death is meaningless. When we live that way, we're saying your death is pointless. Your death has no value. Jesus, you, you, you died on the cross for absolutely nothing. Thanks, but no thanks. I'll try to do it on my own again. 
You know, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 21, the Bible says very clearly, Paul writes here, he says, I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. I do not treat God's grace as if it has no value, as if it has no purpose, as if it's void of anything meaningful. He said, for if keeping the law, if me being right, if me doing good things, if me living by my religious checklist, if keeping the law can make us right with God, then there was no reason for Christ to die. In essence, he's saying when I try to live a life where I'm good enough that I can make God happy and that I deserve to go to heaven and that I earn that right, uh, as, even as flawed as I am, when I, when I live a, a life good enough that I think I'm going to get there, he said we are treating Christ's death as meaningless. You see, Jesus didn't die on the cross for people that are more messed up than you and me. He died on the cross for people that are exactly messed up as you and me. He, he died on the cross for all of us to offer the opportunity of grace where he paid the price, paid a debt that we don't even deserve that kind of gift. And Paul says, so when I'm acting like I'm going to be just Enough, enough to get, to get there. there. I'm going We're to be nullifying the value of his grace. Jesus died because there is no other way. That's not plan B. That's it. And if it's not by his grace, there is no other way. So when you and I live outside of grace, God gives us that liberty. He gives us that license. He says, look, through the Apostle Paul, he says, you, you want to live by the law? Okay. Okay, go ahead. You can live by the law but you're going to be judged by the law. And Romans chapter 3 tells me all of us have sinned, myself included. And the law condemns lawbreakers. And if I want to live trying to be good enough, God looks at my life and he goes, you've got that mess, you've got that mess, you've got that mess. Oh, but come on, God. Come on. I mean, look at how hard I tried. I want to highlight just maybe a couple areas where you and I maybe open our eyes to the reality that we're living outside of a grace-filled relationship with God. You and I cannot say scripturally, we cannot say we are living in a grace-filled relationship with God when we willfully continue to sin. Hebrews chapter 6 addresses that. Hebrews chapter 10 addresses that. We cannot continue to deliberately live in a willful, sinful life and desire to be in a relationship with God. The two don't match. Jesus says in Matthew 17 verse or Matthew 7 verse 17 he says a good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit what he's telling me there is I can look at my own life and see the way I'm living and what I see on the outside really tells me what's on the inside of my life Now that doesn't give me license to go around and start looking at other people and going yep heaven heaven hell heaven hell hell heaven hell we can't judge other people's actions. I do think as brothers and sisters in Christ, it gives us the responsibility when Cain said of Abel, am I my brother's keeper? Absolutely you are. And scripture would point to that time and time again where we look at the fruit in our own lives and we say, you know what? My life does not measure up with scripture. I'm willfully living a disobedient life. That would strongly suggest to me I'm not living in a grace-filled relationship. I'm choosing to live up here by my own actions, my own desires, and that's where I'm going to be judged. Scripture gives us also the responsibility to say to our brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm looking at the fruit. I don't know what's going on inside, but I'm very concerned for you. When we willfully live a disobedient life, we're not living in a grace-filled relationship. I think there are other ways we live outside of that relationship as well. Some of us, we look around us and we start to see other people in their lives and we say, well, at least I'm not as messed up as them. And we begin to compare ourselves to other people. Let's stop and think about that. Why are we comparing? We're basing it on our works. If I'm better than them, then I earn my way to heaven. I'm choosing to live under justice, not under grace. And all of us under justice are condemned. It's amazing that what we can justify in life if we just spend a little bit of time looking around us, we can always find someone who on our own scale of righteousness is doing worse than us and we feel justified. Or maybe you're living outside of a grace-filled relationship with the words that I hear from so many Christians uh, so often at the end of their life when we say, I hope 
I'm good enough. I hope I go to heaven. I hope God is happy with me. I hope, you know, in 1 John, the author there, John, writes, I believe God impresses on him to write, I write these things so that you may know that you have salvation. Christians should be able to live life going, I know. I know that I'm saved. I know that I'm in a relationship with God. I know that I'm in a relationship that not only changes my life here, but it's a relationship that's going to transcend time and space beyond the time I draw my last breath. I know. But we don't because we allow the world to mess with our heads and we continue to go back here and go, hmm, I believe in grace, but I hope I'm good enough. And when we get stuck in that trick bag, we nullify the grace and the sacrifice of Jesus. We're saying, it wasn't good enough. It was good enough to get me part way, but I hope my actions finish the deal. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, only those who actually do the will of my Father will enter into heaven. And we go, aha, so that's it. If you live good enough, you enter heaven. Jesus just said that. No. No. What Jesus is saying is you tell a tree by its fruit. And when you and I live a godly life, failed and flawed as we are, messed up as we will be, when we live a godly life and God's changing us from the inside out, there is something dramatically different in the way that we live life and the way the world lives life. And Jesus says it's going to show, and we, we don't live a godly life to earn the right. We live a godly life because that's who we are. We're saved by grace in a relationship with God, and out of thankfulness and respect for the sacrifice that he paid, I'm going to live a life that honors him. He goes on. On Judgment Day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We performed many miracles in your name. We taught junior high boys for 20 years, God. Surely that counts for something. And he says, get away from me. I never knew you. God, let me go down my religious laundry list of how great I am. I don't know you. Because you see, it's about relationship. And when you and I live in a relationship with God, there are things that we do and there are things that we won't do out of love and respect for him. So if I'm living outside of that grace-filled relationship, what do I do? I just want to touch on three suggestions. I mean, three, uh, I think, uh, successive steps that you and I can take that might better direct us into a relationship with him grace filled the first is repent we've got to change the way we think we talked last week repentance in acts chapter 26 verse 20 the apostle paul says i've preached repentance and to prove your repentance by your deeds when i change the way that i think that's repentance and it is proved in the way that i live Look, the reason that you and I willfully sin and we willfully sin and we willfully sin and we willfully step outside the, the guidelines that God set, we willfully miss the mark is because somewhere in our thinking, we really don't think God is serious about it. Let me tell you one thing I never did in life growing up. I never laid a finger on my mother. I've heard of other kids, other boys, you know, you reach that age um, where the testosterone starts flowing through your body as a kid and you get brain damage and you think you're really all that tough. And I've met a number of other boys. I've talked to dads who've had this happen with their sons where their sons will bow up on their mom. And they'll get right in their face. You don't tell me what to do. You don't. And I've talked to lots of dads who have sent their boys flying across the house because of that attitude. That thought never crossed my mind. Never. Because my dad told me once when I was in about sixth grade, he said, let me tell you something, young man. He said, that's my wife. And if you ever get in her face, I do not care how far you run or where you hide. I will hunt you down. And when I find you, you will be sorry. I'm like trying to look past him going, Mom, can he say that? She's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, amen. You go, you kill him right now. 
Thought never crossed my mind because I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt he was dead serious about that. And somehow in our mixed up thinking, we think God's really not, I mean, come on, God, really, everybody's doing this. Why is it such a big deal if I do it? You're not really serious about that, are you? We sin because somewhere in our screwed up thinking, we think it's not really that big a deal. Maybe he didn't see me. Maybe it's okay. I'll tell him I'm sorry later. Repentance is changing the way that we think. And when I begin to change the way I think, there are definitely things in life I will not do because I know it offends a holy and righteous God and he's not playing games. But then right on the heels of that, we need to seek forgiveness. When I change the way I think and when I start seeing what a worthless worm I am, even in all of my self-righteousness, I think we need to go back to God like David did in Psalm 51. We talked last week about David's sin with Bathsheba. He had Uriah murdered. I mean, he just kind of, he just really, really messed up. Right after that, Nathan the prophet confronts him, and and David has this repentance. This he, It's like the light comes on, and he realizes he sees himself in a whole new light. And so, and then he seeks God's forgiveness, and he writes this in Psalm 51, verses 1 through 4. He says, have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion. Blot out the stain of my sin. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion, and it haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I've done what is evil in your sight, and you'll be proved right in what you say. And your judgment against me is just Do you see what David's saying as he seeks forgiveness there? God, I deserve everything that you would ever heap upon me. But I would ask that you please forgive me. And that you might help restore this relationship that has been fractured between me and you. And there may be some of us today that need to change the way we think. And we need to hit our knees and beg God for his forgiveness and for his mercy. Oh, his love hasn't quit. But we need him to step into our lives in a profound and different way. And the last thing I would follow that up with is we need to just dive into that relationship. The Bible talks about us repenting. It talks about us confessing as we enter into this relationship with Christ, saying, I do believe that you were the Christ. I do believe that you and the gift that you offer is the only answer for my sin sickness. I want your grace in my life. And as we enter into that relationship, Scripture talks about uh, obedience and baptism and how we proclaim to everyone who's there that this is the stand I'm taking. This is the direction I'm going in life. But Romans chapter 12, verse 2 I love what the Apostle Paul writes there because this is, this is kind of how this works. My part and God's part in this relationship. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, he says there in the beginning. That's my part. Because I've changed the way I think and because I want to be in a close relationship with you, God, I'm not going to live like everybody else. And here's God's part. He says, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Isn't that cool? God doesn't just expect us to stand back and go, no, I can't do that. 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 He doesn't want us to go through life going, no, 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 can't have any fun, can't do this, can't do that. He doesn't want us to be a continual struggle. He says, I want to help you change from the inside out. I want to make you a new person by changing the way that you think. You see, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, God saved you by his grace when you believed And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. I read an article this last week in a leadership magazine that talked about the Marvel comics and the Marvel universe. And there are a lot of um, younger people today that are just um, really caught up in that whole idea of the Marvel universe and the Marvel comics. You know, it's got like Ant-Man is the new one and Batman and Superman and all the other mans and women's that can do weird things. And... um, This whole universe has said uh, there are a lot of different characters, but there's one common thread woven through all the storylines. And that is people are looking for a hero to help them because they are unable to survive on their own. 
And you know, I, I see that in the comics and I see people yearning for that saying, I need a hero because of my inability to save myself. Mankind is crying out for that every day and we love to see it in the movies and we love to read about it in stories where we are saved when we can't save ourselves. And the irony is we believe it in the movies, but we don't carry that over to our spiritual life. God, I need you because I can't save myself. We're going to stand and sing a couple songs here in just a minute. Actually, you can stand, you can sit, where, whatever you feel led to do. But I want you to know as we open up the time for communion and for offering, it's also a time where maybe God's convicting you and you want to spend time praying. Maybe you want to go to the prayer room here next door and pray with someone. I want to encourage you today, if God's convicting your heart and you've been living a life where you think you're good enough, I would so encourage you to reevaluate. Because God said you and I will never be good enough. I would encourage you to get back into that relationship of grace where he can change you from the inside out. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, your grace is immeasurable. Father, you paid a high price to just make a relationship with you possible. And I can't even fathom that you still give us the option of walking away from that. You still give us the option of trying to justify uh, ourselves and, and to live by our own righteousness. But I thank you for your truth that has laid out the end game in all of those choices. If we want to be justified by our works, we'll be judged by our works. And God, where you see a problem with, with no possible solution, you've created a solution in your son. And I pray that his grace... His grace might reach into each and every one of our lives today. That we might not disrespect or discount it anymore, but that we might wholly surrender to you and you might begin a new work in us. We ask these things in Jesus' name.